Good afternoon and welcome. As uh, the Senior Director of the Africa Center here at the Atlantic Council, I am thrilled to welcome you to our 2023 Africa Day celebration. It's a big one, the 16th anniversary. Africa Day celebrates the founding of the Organization of African Uni Unity, the predecessor of the African Union on May 25th, 1963. The day commemorates the challenges that the African nations have overcome in defining their own sovereignty. It celebrates the progress uh, the people of the continent have achieved. It calls attention to the remaining efforts needed to secure equal opportunities for Africans. For this special occasion, we wanted a special conversation. And before welcoming Representative Sarah Jacobs and Representative Ilan Omar for a timely conversation with the Congress, allow me to give the floor to a very special keynote speaker, a group of African young people who wanted to share with you the members of Congress and our public audience, a few thoughts about the challenges facing the continent. Tech, creative industries, climate, democracy, and women's empowerment. Their vision is powerful. Representatives Jacobs and Omar will have the opportunity to react after, right after this three minute video message. To achieve success, the U.S. will also have to work with African governments to strengthen their broadband network infrastructure, because without it, we can't open up an empowered, willing and able labor market of the fastest growing populations in the world, which are mostly African. The U.S. will also have to reignite and make more prominent its relationship with Africa to drive the adoption of outsourcing jobs, tech jobs specifically, that will drive economic growth both in Africa, but also within the U.S. I would love for you to think about setting funds and exchange programs specifically tailored for the creative and cultural industries, especially in the Francophone countries who are often left behind, but not less creative. I would also love for you to think about skills and networking programs that could help founders of initiatives like Irawo in Benin or Birinia in Cote d'Ivoire, who are doing an amazing job at showcasing and creating wealth through the creative industries. Thank you. With the upcoming Paris Climate Summit in June and COP28 in December, my hopes are that Bretton Hood institutions and other US DFIs take strong commitment in support of the energy transition in Africa. Scientific reports show how extreme water and climate change are undermined human health and safety, water and water security and socio-economic development. It is imperative to set up mitigation and adaptation projects. Mitigation solutions can be strengthening the energy transition with the development of renewable and green energy. Young women and men of Africa are not the future, they are the present. They need to be not included, they need to be prioritized. That prioritization should happen uh, in the form of mainstreaming youth in all levels of engagement uh, between the United States and Africa in the future. My expectations from U.S. policy to Africa is for us to provide a space where women feel comfortable and encouraged to pursue whichever paths they want to in life. I envision a future where African women are not only motivated to further their education and pursue their dreams, but they also feel safe doing so. Whether it's starting your own business, breaking into tech, or being a stay-at-home mom, I want African women to have the freedom to choose whichever lives they want to live without facing systemic barriers and social stigma. It is not enough for us to promote equality and inclusion, but we also have to cultivate environments where women are supported once glass ceilings have been broken. Thank you. So, big start uh, for this conversation. Uh, Gladys, Miriam, Mohamed, Sakina, Daniel, and Tosin. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank them for uh, kicking off this new series uh, that highlights the youth engagement at the Atlantic Council, the African Youth Speaks. Uh, from Togo to Burkina Faso, from Nigeria to Sudan, and even Paris, uh, their testimonies will guide us during this conversation. Um, so I'm delighted to be joined uh, by you both. Uh, you are young, too, and pioneers. Um, 
Republic, Rep Representative Sarah Jacobs, you are the youngest member of the Democratic House leadership. You sit on the House Foreign Affairs, where you have been recently elected ranking member um, for the subcommittee on Africa. You also sit on the House Armed Services uh, Committee and belong to many caucus, um, for example, women. Um, Representative Jacobs, you represent the uh, 51st District of California. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Representative Ilan Omar, you are the first born on the continent to become a member of Congress, of the US Congress, the first black woman to represent Minnesota, and one of the first two Muslim American women elected to Congress. You are a member of the House Budget Committee. You serve on the House Education and Workforce Committee. You are also the chairwoman of the US Africa Policy Working Group. You launched earlier this year. You will tell us more about it. Thank you for joining us too. Great to be here with you, Ambassador. Uh, with that, Representative Jacobs, I would like to start with you. A uh, very quick question. Often overlooked, the US Congress has an important role in foreign policy. Uh, what does the Congress bring in the US Africa uh, policy alongside the executive branch? Yeah, well, thank you. And, and I think Congress does have an important role to play in foreign policy, um, both in making sure that more voices are heard um, when policies are being made. Um, Congress actually has the constitutional right to declare war and peace. And so when we're looking at all of US military engagements around the world, I think it's really important that Congress is involved in doing that oversight and understanding where we, we have troops abroad, why, what's the mission. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we need to do a little bit more of that oversight, truthfully. Um, Congress also has a really important uh, role to play in, in security assistance and improving a security assistance and, and making sure that we are um, doing it in a way that aligns with our values, um, which is something I, I spend a lot of time focused on. Um, and at the end of the day, Congress is who funds the executive branch. And so we have a responsibility and, and frankly bear a burden when, when we, for instance, fund the Defense Department at so much higher levels than you know the mm -hmm. State Department and USAID, and, and that really comes from Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Ilan Omar, what do you expect to add in the DC Africa conversations uh, with the Africa um, Policy Working Group you just created? With Ara Jacobs, I think, yes. with member too. I'm a member, yes. Yeah. And we, mm -hmm. we just actually had our first briefing today. Okay. So, so there, there's been... Sarah and I are tag teaming on, on Africa Day yes. um, uh, today. Um, I, I, I think the, 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 the reason um, and, and the mission and the focus of the working group really is, is around what the theme is today for um, Africa Day, which is our Africa, our future. Mm -hmm. um, our work uh, in, in this um, working group is to try to figure out how do we become better authentic partners mm -hmm. with the continent? How do we create uh, a lasting relationship um, that is both mutually beneficial um, and one that creates a better um, uh, trust and, and furthers um, our ability to cultivate uh, that, that relationship? Mm -hmm. We know that um, Africa and its countries are not able to respond um, to the United States when it comes to um, addressing extremism, um, addressing the, the needs for investment, addressing um, you know, uh, the creation of jobs, addressing uh, empowerment of young girls and, and women, mm -hmm. um, as, as one of the speakers talked about. Uh, if we do not have uh, established the relationship that is based on trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we are trying to do with um, this working group <clears throat> is to try to invite people mm -hmm. um, who oftentimes do not get an audience with members of Congress mm -hmm. um, to engage civil society, um, to engage people who are drafting policy uh, mm -hmm. on the continent, to engage the diplomatic corps, uh, to invite the State Department to engage members of Congress that do not have um, a portfolio uh, that includes 20, 20 members in this yes. of Congress in this group. Right? Uh, and today, even uh, at our um, first briefing, we had members that are not part mm -hmm. of the working group come uh, to hear about uh, what's happening in in Sudan. And so that's that's sort of the idea uh, mm -hmm. to remove the limitations that a committee mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. 
and to create a, um, a better space for us to, to engage with the continent. We'll come to that topic specifically with you, Sudan, um, later in this conversation. Uh, allow me to come back uh, to, you, to your colleague. Both of you, you attended the Atlantic Council Africa dinner a few months uh, ago that kicked off the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit in Washington. Uh, which set the stage for stronger U.S. commitment um, to the continent. And since then, uh, numerous members of the U.S. cabinet, um, including the Vice President Harris and the Secretary, the Treasury Secretary Yellen, visited 18 countries, 18 African countries in three months. Um, it's a lot. Well, what, what's, what's going on? Do, do you think that uh, this summit has been a turning point, Sarah Jacobs, or work in progress? Do you expect more? Well, look, I think that what we've seen both with the summit and with uh, the visits and the announcements that have followed is that the Biden administration really recognizes the importance of re-engaging with the African continent that we know, especially over the four years prior and the previous administration, didn't get the kind of attention that it deserved from, uh, from the American government. And so I think this is really about understanding that Africa is the fastest growing continent. It has the youngest population. It's the fastest growing economies, that there is a real importance in making sure that we are partnering with Africa, partnering with Africans um, on our shared values, on our shared interests. And I think we're going to continue seeing more of that from the Biden administration. And um, precisely, um, Representative Omar, uh, the context is important. And this happened at the very moment of, of this war in Ukraine uh, with a new geopolitical order or disorder, I, I, I don't know yet. Um, South African um, President Cyril Ramaphosa announced a few days ago um, a delegation of African presidents, will, um, including um, uh, Egypt, uh, Republic of Congo, Zambia, Senegal, and Uganda, would meet with President Putin from Russia and Zelensky from Ukraine um, to present a a, new, a peace plan for, for Africa. Uh, have you been surprised uh, by this initiative and uh, do you believe in its success? Um, I am not surprised. Um, I think it is important for us to remember um, when the, the United States um, was uh, debating um, support for the uh, for Ukraine, um, for in the Russia-Ukraine war, um, at the UN or UN Security Council, that the biggest defenders mm -hmm. um, of sovereignty and territorial integrity um, came from uh, heads of African countries. Mm -hmm. And it is really also important to recognize that there is an argument, right, to, to be made mm -hmm. Um, when, when we think about how African countries see uh, themselves um, as they interact with the international community, especially the United States. Um, there is still um, uh, awful um, remembrance of, of the Cold War and mm. um, imperialistic mentality um, that many African countries are weary of. Uh, and so when we put uh, uh, the converse, when the conversation becomes about uh, democracy versus autocracy, um, many African countries would love to have the conversation be about sovereignty and um, territorial integrity. And you know, if they are to see this war as a proxy war between Russia and the United States, um, they are going to start to think about what is in their best interest. Is alliance with one good for them, um, or is non-alliance their path forward? And we are seeing many of them declaring their independence in that regard and saying, you know, we want to create policies um, and forward policies for ourselves uh, that get us the best relationships possible for investment, for development, um, for strengthening um, uh, our institutions. And so what we have to be able to do is offer yeah. that alignment um, through yeah. honest partnership. Uh, and, and that is the best way I think we compete um, in, 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 this, in this moment. We also have to 
realize the kind of economic impact when it comes to um, imports of essential goods um, that the African continent has suffered. Um, because, you know, when it comes to things like wheat, uh, Russia and Ukraine were the biggest exporters um, to, to the continent. Today I was uh, meeting with an ambassador, the, the Tunisian ambassador, um, and, you know, the, the, the level of impact that the war has had on, on the continent is not something that we're spending a lot of time talking about and addressing. And I think there is a role for the United States um, to collectively work with the continent to fill that void. Uh, and I think that is how we, we move forward. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of competition, um, we heard China and Russia, of course, <laughs> and uh, um, Sarah Jacobs, on the occasion of your appointment as a ranking member, uh, you said the, the African continent has long been ignored, neglected, and exploited by the international community, especially by the West, largely receiving attention in only the most dire circumstances and through a paternalist approach. So uh, we live a time of competition between global powers on the African continent, but also regional powers, including Emirates, uh, Turkey, Israel. Um, but for Russia and China, Africa is seems to be a matter of national security through the the access to the critical minerals, for example, <coughs> or more politically, the 30% African um, votes um, at the UN, at the United Nations. Um, Israel and Emirates, I just mentioned, have also engaged um, ways to for rebel lands. Um, the US uh, promised a lot during the US-Africa Leader Summit, uh, but seems to want to catch up. Um, so why, why the US uh, did not understand earlier that Africa is also a matter of national security for, 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 for them too. Well, I think the previous administration had a very misguided view of what makes America strong around the world. Um, and I think that you know that's something that, that the Biden administration is working really hard to fix and, and to undo a lot of the damage that was caused by the previous administration, both in Africa and around the world. And that's why I think this African Leader Summit and this re-engagement is so important and why we need to understand that while there is competition now, um, we can't only view our relationship with Africa through the lens of competition. Mm -hmm. So I think some of the key lessons from the Cold War are that supporting authoritarian actors for our short-term alignment or influence actually has really harmful impacts. Mm -hmm. And we see in places like Chad, Angola, DRC, US efforts to counter the Soviet Union and its proxies actually caused backsliding, violence, and their populations and governments are still suspicious of the US because of those actions taken during the Cold War. And we know Africa has the youngest population, so the decisions we make now are gonna have really long-term consequences. And you know, I think we need to re-engage re with Africa because it's important for us, not because it's a competition with Russia and China. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to match them one for one. We don't need to you know, ignore our values because we wanna make sure someone doesn't go work with Wagner Group mm -hmm. uh, or you know, they're gonna do a deal with the Chinese. We need to work with Africans where it makes sense for us and where it makes sense for the local community and, and do what's in all of our long-term best interest and not get so focused on this short-term competition. Mm -hmm. um, let's, would you like to add something? Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the great powers um, uh, competition uh, lens uh, sort of, I think, invokes again um, that imperial imperialistic uh, mm -hmm. mentality, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think for many of these African countries um, want to have partners that are uh, not reminding them of sort of the, the horrors of the Berlin Conference where, you know, who gets to, to own which African country um, and, and dividing them up in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. Many of them want to, like I said earlier, they want these investments, they want, mm -hmm. um, you know, partners that are coming in and investing in, in development. And I think we can play a role um, in the United States to have a foreign policy that says, look, 
you can work with China, you can work with Russia, but when it comes to investment, um, you know, th these are these are countries that don't have human rights standards. They don't have labor standards. They, um, you know, uh, don't have environmental standards for their projects. Um, what we are uh, able to offer is A, B, and C, uh, and then also then do actually <laughs> invest. Um, what we provide uh, most of the time um, is sort of this discipline, punitive. Um, engagement of you have to do these things uh, and even if those countries were to fulfill this list they, they are not sure that the kind of investment that they would be getting from China or Russia would come in and so we have to also be a guarantee of, of that investment. Um, speaking of um, the ability or freedom African countries have to speak to uh, the other powers um, I'm sure you have not missed this drama around South Africa um, um, and, and the U.S. The, the U.S. ambassador uh, said that South Africa secretly sold arms to, uh, to Russia in December, last December, um, as part of its war, war in, in, in Ukraine. Um, and, and South Africa is, is chairing the BRICS right now, um, this year. So uh, how should, because South Africa is an important country uh, for the historic reasons you know for Africans, how should the U.S. deal with Mandela's country? Because that's, <laughs> that's, that's the point, right? Yeah, well, look, I think that on, on the whole in, in Africa, we're very clear. We're not trying to make people pick sides. That's oh. not what this is about. This is about standing up for shared values like democracy, like human rights. Um, and acknowledging that there are many players in the field and everyone has a role they can play um, and that the United States wants to be a, a partner in this regard. I think when it comes to, to South Africa, I think, you know, the, the, the disturbing things are, you know, the high levels of corruption that we're seeing in the government, the, the not just the, the friendship with Russia, but the, you know, potential evasion of sanctions. Um, you know, I think there's a difference between not having people pick sides and not asking mm -hmm. people to and people proactively evading sanctions and sort of going against the international shared norms that, that we all ascribe to. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, to come back to our young um, people, Africans, who spoke earlier, um, I would like now to dive into the different topics they talked about and starting with women. Um, and I know that you two are really involved in, in this question. And I mentioned that Sarah Jacobs is a member of, of, of the Women Caucus. Um, and I think uh, Johan is too. You are too? Yeah. Oh, both of you. So that's, yeah. that's cool. So any of you can answer this question. So, uh, glad this man mentioned this point. Um, and, and, and you speak up uh, very often when it comes to women, women's rights. So knowing what, what's going on about women's rights in America, a lot these past months. Um, they are once again struggling for their rights, right? Um, what kind of cooperation should um, have women, American women and African women? How could they struggle together around this cause? Well, I think that's a, a great question and a great point. And I also think it highlights why the U.S. needs to engage in these partnerships with some humility, that this really is about partnership, not the U.S. coming and wagging our finger and trying to tell people how to do things, because we're also experiencing challenges here, and we can learn from each other on the best way to engage in these. And I think there is a lot of opportunity for you know, us as women to work together to try and push our governments, push the international community um, to respect our rights and to do things differently. And, and I think that's a real opportunity in what is otherwise a, a kind of difficult time when it comes to women's rights. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> I, I, what, what I was hearing um, from, from the young woman's question um, was, was a little bit about what can, can we do to try to remove barriers. Yeah. Um, because it, it, I often used to say, um, and, and I stole this from my father, who used to say, you know, it's not that women or girls need empowerments. Mm -hmm. They just need obstacles to be removed so that they can step into their power. 
And you know, one of the things that we're doing um, in, in Congress and advocating for, um, for our, our sisters and our siblings who are challenged in, in some of these states that are rolling back um, their um, rights and, and freedoms mm -hmm. is to try to find avenues, right, for them to be able to access um, their their rights. And I think one one of the things that I would advocate for uh, is to to do the same mm -hmm. um, for our, our siblings in in Africa to try um, to advocate for policies that remove barriers to try to advocate for policies that create opportunities for investment. Um, we know that African women are entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do we lift that up? How do we shine um, a, a bright light? Uh, and how do we continue to encourage them to be able to access the markets um, in a more equitable way? Mm -hmm. And we know that African uh, women are really committed for their communities. Yes. And, um, and, and they are... Um, um, uh, uh, true power uh, in African societies, and um, one of the and actually, I think to that point, it's yeah. it's fascinating to me because the only time that that is fully realized mm -hmm. is doing times of conflict. Yeah, right, like doing war. I mean, when I was little, and we were going through war, almost every single family was being saved mm -hmm. by their moms and daughters and sisters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were the ones who were selling their jewelry. They were the ones who were finding avenues of like where to hide and how to um, navigate that system. They're the ones when they escaped into um, a, a place they felt safe, they were sending the, their resources and, and trying to find jobs. And, uh, and I think that's also something that we have to continue to honor and, and yeah. uplift so that doing peacetime, mm -hmm. um, people also recognize their ability to contribute to society as well. Exactly. And there is a fight they are uh, um, engaged in these days. It's uh, the, the fight for climate. Um, and here I would like to, uh, um, to remind what Miriam and, and Daniel said in, in the discussion. Um, we host here at the, at the Africa Center a climate uh, strategy with an African uh, vision, and it has been launched a few months ago by uh, the vice president of, of, of Nigeria. Um, we know, um, Sarah Jacobs, that uh, Africans suffer the most from the global warming, even if they don't contribute uh, to, the, to this global warming. Um, African nations pay the highest price, but they don't receive any funding uh, from the international community for that. The $100 billion um, pledged um, for annual climate financing um, was not met. Um, how, how can the U.S. Um, support Africans in that struggle, and how can they make these uh, pledged um, met? Yeah, I, I, just a month ago, I was in Kenya um, actually looking and meeting with some of the communities that are really impacted by this sixth drought season that they've had. Mm. Um, and, you know, it was it was a really meaningful experience uh, for me to see, you know, you hear about the devastation of, of the droughts, but, but really seeing it firsthand. Um, and I, th I think there's a lot more we need to be doing. Um, I think you know, part of the challenge right now is that we're in the minority. Um, and as you are probably following along, there's a lot of discussion about U.S. spending at the moment. Um, and some of our colleagues want to cut the foreign assistance budget by 22 to 50 percent. And, you know, that will mean that we cannot provide the humanitarian assistance we've been providing to places like West Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, um, that we know are really in need of this humanitarian assistance. Mm -hmm. One of the things we also need to figure out how to get out of is this cycle of constant humanitarian assistance and not doing the longer term resilience work. Um, and that's some of what I was looking at when I was out in Kenya is how we make sure the vast amount of humanitarian money we're, we're giving out mm -hmm. is getting to the people who need it, but yeah. in such a way that we're you know, investing in local communities. So I was really glad to see, for instance, um, yeah. when I was in Kenya, the um, uh, ready to use therapeutic food that they were using. Mm -hmm. um, historically, it had only been able to be produced in a few countries because 
when UNICEF first created it, it ha had a patent with a French company actually, um, but now they were sourcing it directly from a Kenyan company using Kenyan groundnuts. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that kind of thing, making sure that the humanitarian assistance we're doing is actually feeding into longer term resilience is a really important piece of it. While we work to get the funding we know is important, but har hard, harder to get at this particular moment. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I would yeah, like I, to. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think that's that's been a, a sort of the the communication um, uh, disconnect uh, between the uh, the pledge and uh, like actual money. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the commitment seems to be there. Mm -hmm. um, we 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 fought really hard in advocating um, for the United States and the West. Um, in, in creating a fund, right, to, to help mitigate some of the uh, damages um, that they, they've been able to, to cause. Because we know that, you know, all of these countries industrializing um, mm -hmm. has created a burden um, for, for Africa and just the global south. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, you know, the 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 need for these resources is real, um, and we just have to now make sure mm -hmm. um, that the, this commitment is is met. Um, unfortunately, obviously, in the United States, um, especially in, in, in Congress, we don't have a huge ability to be able to, to push for that. We just have to make sure we fight against these devastating cuts. Mm -hmm. um, but to, 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 to be able to fulfill that, that promise is, is going to be um, challenging. And I would say to, to the point about um, you know, us not constantly being stuck in, in, in this space of um, funding crises. Um, you know, rushing to um, put out fires, uh, but but thinking about ways that we can um, create partnerships throughout the continent, whether it's regional, um, whether it is partnership with other Western countries, um, to to say, you know, here is a pool of money that we can pull together um, to create these resilient. Um, plans for for these communities and then help fund it. So today I was reading about an example in in Somalia. Um, you know, Somalia is not that dissimilar to to Kenya. They they experience um, droughts that regularly come um, that bring the country to, on the brick of famine. Um, but they also experience severe flooding mm -hmm. <laughs> that comes right after that. So you have displacement from the droughts, and then you have displacement because of, of the flooding. And so it's a country that is constantly in, in crisis, um, as well as the other instabilities that exist there. And so the United States, through USAID, the, the UK fund, and Qatar fund came together mm -hmm. to put in $10 million. Um, and they're they're going to you know fund projects like um, digging wells and um, creating other um, sustainability uh, for for the country. And I think that's genius. Um, and so we obviously have a space to be a convener as the United States, and we should be using that power and that leverage of convening to try to create those kind of um, investments. Yes. Um, beyond beyond the funding and the financial investment aspect, there's also um, behind this topic of climate, the matter of um, creating jobs and value. Um, these days, we we talk a lot about critical minerals um, in Africa, um, so important for electrical vehicles, for example, mm -hmm. in in the West. Um, so uh, how, how is it possible um, for the US, for example, um, to take advantage of these critical minerals uh, to, you know, for these vehicles and green transition um, without um, making value, creating value for Africans too, because Africans, they need create, create value. Not only raw material should be taken from them, but also jobs should be created uh, on the ground. So how can we solve this problem? Because we missed the opportunity earlier um, in the past to solve this, this, this problem. 
So now how can we draw um, lessons from the past and do better now um, and, and, and work on a transformative economy in Africa? It's, it's a tough question, right? That's, uh -huh. that's, that's the ultimate wish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right? Like, can we yeah. please get to a place yeah. where we learn from past mistakes? Exactly. Um, and, and, and do better um, mm. in, in the future. I think... Uh, you know, vast majority, as you were saying, of, of Africa's um, resources are extracted as raw minerals. Yes. They are um, developed and processed, uh, and oftentimes they are resold, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as we see with oil. There's like almost no refineries in mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. um, even the countries that are oil rich don't have refineries. They have to send it, and then they buy um, buy it back at a, at a higher cost, which makes almost no sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the things I think that we can do and, and we're hoping to do um, is to change, I think, the, the way in which investors here in the United States think Western about, Union? yes, yeah. think about Africa, mm -hmm. right? This is not, you know, there, there is, there is this, this bizarre lens and narrative that is around Africa that one, it's one country. So first of all, we have to say, <laughs> Africa is not a country; it's a continent. Fifty-five, fifty-five um, countries, right? And, <laughs> and um, fifty-four. You know, and Sarah's laughing this because she knows. I mean, there's, there's so many people come up to me; they still they think I'm from Sudan. Like, so there's like there's that sort of space uh -huh. that we're existing in in Washington. <laughs> um, so 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 getting that straightened out first, and then saying. There are many countries mm -hmm. in Africa, right? And even within the country, there are different spots um, where you can go and, and invest um, in. And, you know, there is labor that is ready, as, as we've mentioned multiple times. Mm -hmm. It's the youngest continent. Yes. Um, there are um, infrastructures that could be created mm -hmm. um, to create manufacturing within the continent. Um, and as we have bravely encouraged investment in places like Vietnam um, or Cambodia or um, you know, many other countries that have uh, challenges, um, we should be encouraging the same in, in Africa and, and try to you know, sort of wash away this this really dangerous narrative that the whole continent is on fire and it's not some somewhere anybody should get near unless mm -hmm. they're only trying to put out the fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think another key piece of this is is why the U.S. needs to focus our engagement on on helping to promote good governance and transparency because actually a lot of what you're seeing in the critical critical mineral space, right, is the the Chinese coming in. Mm -hmm. um, buying up the minerals, exporting it. Yeah. Um, we're, we're not seeing a lot of benefit to local communities of that, but we are seeing corrupt officials getting their kickbacks for it, right? And so the more that we can work with local governments, make mm -hmm. sure we're using all of the tools that we have to, to help promote good governance, and importantly, also making sure that what we're doing does not hinder good governance. Yeah. Um, I think that is also an important way to make sure that when these critical mineral deals are being done, they're being done with the people's interest in mind, not just with like certain corrupt officials. I think, uh, I, I, yeah. I would just end on, on this topic. Um, again, I, I mentioned the other, the other countries in, in Asia and like Central America and South America. We, we, we have gotten comfortable mm -hmm. in doing things um, in, in two-step, right? Mm -hmm. we've, we've encouraged for these countries to develop better accountable institutions while we have also encouraged investment and mm -hmm. development. Yes. Um, for Africa, it just seems that we are waiting mm -hmm. <laughs> for these institutions um, to, to be strong mm -hmm. um, without realizing that there, there is no country mm -hmm. that is going to be able to have um, good governance that is going to be able to build the kind of institutions that are necessary mm -hmm. for that good governance um, to, to, to build a very well thought out anti-corruption policy without having resources to mm -hmm. be able to create the economic um, viability and um, and vibrancy mm -hmm. that is needed in order for people to give that government exactly. uh, the credibility and the authority to continue to carry out right its policies. If you're constantly 
worried about whether there's going to be a coup, if you're constantly worried about, you know, whether there's going to be a civil war, if you're constantly worried about all of these things, you're, you're, you, you think you have a very short time. So you're gonna try to extract as much as you can. But if you have the resources to be able to feature people and also build the institutions, and you feel comfortable enough to do that, then I think we will start to see a better uh, outcome mm -hmm. for the continent. I have the impression you want to talk about uh, democracy and good governance. So uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of that, um, I would like to make a focus on Sudan you just mentioned. And today you attended or organized um, a briefing about Sudan, right? Um, the, 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 this country is important to the U.S., um, and, and there is a, a huge fight between two generals who made a coup uh, together a few months ago. So uh, Mohammed uh, mentioned the importance of democracy, of supporting democracy on the African continent. It's important for, for young Africans. And I would like to have your opinion about the U.S. policy to Sudan, um, this policy of sanctions. Uh, is it the best way um, to support democracy? Or uh, do you think that um, actions like uh, organized, launched by U.S. civilian organizations to support um, democracy is a better way to do it. How, what is your opinion about the, the situation in Sudan, both of you? you go first. Um, sure. I mean, the, the latter, obviously. Um, you know, we we believe in in respecting the the will of the Sudanese people to see a civilian governance. Um, there has been a, a decade long. Um, decades-long effort by uh, the Sudanese people um, to not live under military dictatorship. And, you know, although the civilian government and, and the people's actualization of that was short-lived, uh, I think it's really important for us to not look at this situation um, and, and address the, the, the crisis um, by only treating um, these generals with, with the legitimacy that they want. Yeah. But, but using this as a, as a time to, to legitimize civil society, mm -hmm. um, because they're the ones now that are delivering the humanitarian aid. They're the ones that are in, in the forefront um, providing uh, for, for the people that are so devastated by this war. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that we have done right um, is to encourage for ceasefire, mm -hmm. um, to use regional partners who have um, influence uh, to lead the talks, whether it's Saudi Arabia or um, leaders in, in EGAD mm -hmm. um, or you know, South Sudan that, that has sort of uh, a sibling relationship um, with Sudan, also you know, as sibling relationships go, mm -hmm. <laughs> not always smooth. Um, and, I, and I think that the, the path forward, um, if we are to move with sanctions, it has to be very targeted. And we heard from folks today who were very adamant about the kind of sanctions that they wanted to see and um, ways in which we can do these sanctions without causing economic and personal harm um, to, to the people of, of Sudan, yeah. 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 I mean, um, as usual on, on these topics, Ilhan and I, I agree. I, I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned from what's happened in Sudan over the past few years. Mm -hmm. I think the first is that from the get-go, the United States should have put the civilian leadership more in the driver's seat and used the moment in time that we had and used the leverage that we had in that moment to to try and 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 make sure we were getting civilian rule and you know I think we have often seen in many cases that peace agreements that rely only on military leaders or are really premised on the idea that armed groups are going to share power um, they don't tend to work. Mm -hmm. um, we know peace agreements last longer when they have civil society, when they have women, they have more representation around the table. Um, and so we need to do a better job of making sure, as Ilhan said, we're not just empowering the two generals with legitimacy, but we're actually listening and working more closely with local civilian voices and making sure that they're part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So uh, the time is uh, flying, so I would like to um, end this conversation uh, with two 
uh, maybe more focused que questions on, on, on both of you. Um, Sarah Jacobs, I remember you the first time you honored us by attending our first event on creative industries. It was um, during time uh, of COVID. And, um, and, 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 and I wanted to have you here one day uh, to speak about more about creative industries, certainly because you come from California, um, the land of, of, of Hollywood, right? And, um, and Sakina mentioned the importance of creative industries um, as a new market. And, uh, and our dream here at the Africa Center is to, um, to connect more um, Hollywood and Nollywood, um, unless Bollywood <laughs> does it. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but uh, we remember this um, last month, I think, uh, VP Harris visited Ghana and studios. She is also from California. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, we know how important the, 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 the narrative is, uh, the Africa, changing the African narrative is um, when it comes to, um, to creative industries. Uh, the effect of Wakanda is certainly uh, strong. <laughs> and uh, right tomorrow, um, Whiskid and Bruna Boy will attend uh, the, the, the Miami Afro um, Nation Festival. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask you one question about this. Um, what could you say to and do maybe to encourage your constituencies to invest in African creative industries? Yeah, look, I think um, I, I love Nollywood movies. Um, <laughs> when I lived in Ghana, I would listen to a lot of Ghanaian and Nigerian music uh, out at the the clubs. Um, oh, <laughs> and, uh, you want to say more about it? Uh, no, no, I don't. Okay, okay. Um, but, uh, please do. <laughs> please, yeah. We are, we are listening. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I do think that there's real opportunity there. And, and, you know, I think we've already seen some amazing collaborations and, and I think we'll continue to do so. And, um, you know, I think um, we should make sure that that the U.S. is open to talent from all over the world mm. um, because that's what's always made America um, the, this great innovative place. And, yeah. um, you know, I think we need to do a better job of, of being welcoming to creative and other talent from Africa. Exactly. And my last question uh, for Representative Omar, uh, personal too, more personal. Uh, I said when I started, you are the first Congress member to be born on the African continent. It puts you in a very special position of, um, of role model for Americans and Africans too. Um, how do you see uh, the role of African Americans and immigrants uh, in the US policy to Africa? Um, what do you think of the presidential diaspora group launch after the US Africa Day Summit. Um, we, we hosted for our first, my first Africa Day at the Atlantic Council, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, mm. and, and, and she mentioned the importance of uh, the African Americans in the US policy to Africa. How do you see this, this question? Um, I, I, I miss the uh, ambassador um, when, when she was uh, um, at the Africa desk. She used to tour mm. um, the country and meet with um, the, the African diaspora community. And um, she also helped administer my resettlement to this country. So, um, so I, I know that her um, commitment um, to, to engaging the, the diaspora is a, ser it's a serious one. Um, I, th I think, you know, there, there shouldn't really be mm -hmm. um, uh, policy that's being created um, about Africa without Africans, whether they are Africans living in the continent or they are Africans in the diaspora. Um, I think that there is a missed opportunity when you don't have us at the table um, and at the driver's seat. Um, majority of the internal policies within any given African country mm -hmm. um, is oftentimes influenced by Africans in the diaspora, mm -hmm. um, whether it is advocating for independence, um, whether it is advocating for um, you know, creative ways to, to fight extremism, um, whether it is advocating for better educational opportunities, um, uh, business and, and investment opportunities. Uh, there is a lot, there's a huge voice um, that diaspora groups have um, 
uh, when when it comes to different African African countries, and you know just even the 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 econo they they're also they also serve as the economic engine. I think something like forty four billion dollars of remittances um, is 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 sort of what uh, the African diaspora sends back uh, to to the continent, and. We, I think, have to take our role and our responsibility more seriously. One, I think, you know, education is important. Um, if, if we want more people to care about Africa, we have to be talking about Africa, educating people about Africa. Mm -hmm. um, but we also, I think, have um, an important role in, in shifting the narrative about Africa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and... Uh, and sort of crafting a new narrative. Yeah. Um, I think this this idea that we constantly have to only be asking for help mm -hmm. um, and pushing for humanitarian assistance um, or involvement from our governments to stop a coup or a civil war, um, and that's the only time they hear from us, uh, has to end. Yeah. Um, we also have to be leaders in asking for um, more investments to take mm -hmm. place, uh, more companies uh, to, to, to go into. And one of the, one of the things that I've, I've been doing and, and will continue to do is encourage my colleagues mm -hmm. um, to utilize their, their convening um, power uh, to encourage mm -hmm. businesses within their congressional districts uh, to think about investing. Yeah. Uh, in in the continent, because the opportunities are are endless. Yes. Um, and 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 I I hear about it all the time. You know, as I attend investment conferences um, for the continent, there there's just a, a, a real honest opportunity for many of these um, businesses to be able to make good money mm -hmm. um, while the continent benefits. Well, thank you very much. Um, Representative Omar and, uh, and Jacobs for this very inspiring conversation. It was uh, a worldwide tour and discussion uh, from Pretoria to Paris, Washington to Beijing. So, um, which means that Africa is, is a strategic player and it is at the center of, of, of the world. And we, we are very lucky and honored to have you uh, both for this uh, 16th anniversary of the African Union. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, next June, uh, we will have uh, the same sitting, but maybe different conversation with Republican members uh, of the Congress. And uh, on that note, uh, talk soon. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.